Kia ora koutou. We'll just wait for a few of you to start trickling in before we start with a karakia as you're trickling in. If you do want to let us know who you are and where you're from, please feel free to pop it in the chat. Okay, so I think we have a critical mass that we can get started. So we'll start off with a karakia welcoming you all to this space. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tāra tāra ki tai, e hi a ke ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei, mauri ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Miriam Sessa hau. Firstly, I want to start by acknowledging uh, Tangata Whenua and Tipuna in Aotearoa, the Manoa Whenua where we are broadcasting from, as well as the land that you're joining us from. Before I introduce the session for today and our fabulous presenter, I just wanted to um, do our usual housekeeping and or virtual um, housekeeping for the session. So I know many of you are returning um, returning attendees to our Toanes Toi Caucus webinars. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And some of us, some of you might be new. So for those who are new, just a reminder that this webinar will cover um, topics of domestic violence and child, child abuse. And we just encourage all of you to check in with yourself throughout the session, check in with people after the session. And if there's um, anything that gets stirred up, that, a reminder about our national helplines that are there to support us. There's going to be a bit of interactivity in the session today. So um, the way you can engage with us and in particular with our presenter is through the chat. Um, there is a quirk in the chat. If you don't select to everyone, which is in the drop down box next to two. It will only come to um, Julie and I. But if you want to let everyone know, um, please select to everyone. And so I can see a few people letting us know where you're all from. So lovely to have you here. There is also a Q&A function, um, which many of you will be familiar with, and that's where you can ask questions. So please feel free to ask, ask questions as we go, um, as well as at the end, there will be some time for question and answer. And um, a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and we are very lucky that actually there are some really comprehensive notes that are going to be sent out along with um, the recording, hopefully over the next couple of days. Now that is all from me um, and I am very privileged and, and feel um, really excited about today's session and want to warmly welcome Julie Sage here, um, who's going to be offering us this webinar for today. So kia ora, um, Julie, over to ora. you. Thanks, Mariam. Kia ora to you and um, tēnā koutou katoa to everybody out there. Uh, so just an introduction for me, ko mau tomonga. Ko Tauranga Moana, ko Ngāti Pākehā te iwi, ko Julie Sage Takawingua. So I'm coming to you from Tauranga Moana, um, where I um, work for an agency called Totoko My Sexual Harm Support, and my rather grandiose title is Social Change Leader. So um, that's um, what I currently do, but in for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been around in the family and sexual violence sector for a little bit too long to actually say without giving away my age, but about 30 years, if I do a big count up, um, I started working in corrections as a probation officer and um, through, then went on to train in counselling and social work and um, have worked in private practice as a counsellor. Um, and more recently was working for the Family Violence Death Review Committee and the Joint Venture Business Unit in Wellington before I moved back to my hometown where my mokopuna lives and where my heart is. So a little bit about me. Um, but I also just want to say a few things about what we're going to be talking about today because we're talking um, about a bit of a paradigm shift in child protection practice. And in order to do this, we have to talk about practice that needs to shift. So sometimes I'll be using examples of where I've seen practice that um, I think needs to shift. So I'm not referring to any one agency or trying to pick out any particular part of the system. It's a whole of system change that I'm talking to. Um, 
so yeah, it's not a personal thing about any agency in particular. I really wanted you to understand that because over the 30 years of my work in this area, I've done a lot of things wrong and I, um, I can talk to those as well. So um, I'm not shifting myself away from that. Um, talking about this might challenge our thinking a little bit and I really hope that it does because I think that when we're at the edges of, of our thinking, that's where new practice can evolve. Um, so don't take it personally, it's a system approach that we're talking about. And I also want to say a little bit about language. Um, I'll be using the words perpetrator and victim survivor today. And I just want to say that that's really terms that I would use in a group like this, where we're a group of professionals and I'm using it only in this group as a help, helpful shorthand for us to understand who I'm speaking to, who I'm referring to in my speaking. But I'm not imposing that language on anybody and I'm not asking that you join with me in that language and I know there's plenty of other ways to speak about the people who use our services and when I'm speaking to different groups I would change my language so I certainly wouldn't be going out and talking with perpetrators and calling them perpetrators but for, for the shorthand of today's session I will be using that kind of language but yeah take it take it um, as you will take it or leave it I guess um, and the other thing I think it's important to say is that I'm not just referring to men as perpetrators and women as victim survivors we acknowledge that um, there are men who are also victim survivors and women who are perpetrators so sometimes I slip into using pronouns that indicate that I'm talking mostly about men but please don't take it to mean that I'm always suggesting that that's the only way that things can be but um, by far I mean, we know that predominantly it is a very gendered issue and we'll be talking about the gender issues as we go through because um, I think there's a lot a lot to be said in that area. So just I'm just going to share my screen. So... This is a, a one hour overview of the Safe and Together approach. Um, and we will just be going through it. Sorry, Miriam, I'm trying to manage, trying to get this to change. There we go. So just before we do that, I really just wanted to say a little bit about Totoka Mai so you understand a bit more about my context. So we're based in Tauranga Whakatane in Hamilton, and we cover the Bay of Plenty and the Waikato. And we're probably one of the only eight sexual violence agencies that covers um, all four parts of this. We, all our medical services are in-house, including um, our forensic service, and all of that is um, DHB funded. We have crisis counselling and social work service, which is MSD funded. We're also a treatment supplier for ACC sensitive claims. We have over 80 counsellors who contract to us um, and more recently we've moved into more of a prevention space so we've contracted through ACC to deliver the Mates and Dates program which is a healthy relationships program and then in 2021 we became a partner agency with the Safe and Together Institute. So a little bit about the journey to becoming a partner agency with the Safe and Together Institute because it's quite a journey. Um, in 2016, the Family Violence Death Review had a conference in Wellington where David Mandel was the key, keynote speaker, and he's the director of the institute. So in 2017, I was funded by Fidrick to go to the Melbourne Safe and Together Conference. And then in 2019, um, when I'd moved back to Tauranga, we invited David Mandel to come to Te Puki, um, and we had over 300 um, workers from around the Bay of Plenty and the Waikato attend a one-day overview. And that was funded and supported by the local Oranga Tamariki office. So that was pretty amazing. And we thought the next step was that we would be getting the Institute out to New Zealand to run core modules for us. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit. And all our plans were disrupted and we couldn't see how we were going to um, get the core training out. So um, in discussions with 
David and the Institute, we decided instead that we would um, undertake training to become trainers so that in Aotearoa New Zealand we had people who were trained and we weren't going to be dependent on people coming from overseas to deliver the training. And then in that way too that we could make it more um, connected to the work, our work and using our language and using our understandings to shape it a little bit. So that's a little bit about the story of how we got to be talking about Safe and Together. So just the name really says it all. Safe and Together is founded on the idea that children's well-being is best served when they can be kept safe and together with the non-offending or the non-violent parent. So just like we need to be culturally competent and confident and trauma-informed in our practice, we also need to have a DV-informed child protection-based practice. And it's something that we can add to our current practice. It's not, it's not a whole approach, it's just for, it's for cases where there is um, mums and dads and children and domestic violence happening. And it's, it's a way to frame up and think about how we work with that family and their wider system. So the objectives for the session today is to introduce to you a perpetrator passion framework. So we, this is language that you will hear a lot. It's a perpetrator pattern based approach. It means that the starting point is an understanding perpetrator patterns across time, across locations and across relationships. And it's trying really hard to get away from an incident based approach. So it's looking at a perpetrator pattern across a multitude of contexts. Um, in particular, it's got quite an emphasis or a critical understanding of coercive control. Um, and it comes from a point based on Evan Stark's work that under, we need to understand coercive control as a liberty crime. And when I say that, what I mean is, how does the perpetrator's actions narrow and limit the lives of both the victim, survivor, and the children? And we need to do this if we're going to be effective in our work. And the approach orientates back to perpetrator patterns time and time again. It's the starting point, it's the bedrock, it's the beginning part of any work with a family. So the second of objective is to introduce to you and help you to explore some of the principles and the components of the Safe and Together approach and how those might guide practice. Um, it's to think about how to use it as a way to enhance good practice and also to share information about further training that you might be interested in. So the mission of, this is the broader mission of the entire um, Safe and Together Institute to create, nurture and sustain a global network of domestic violence informed child welfare professionals, communities and systems. So I guess what I wanted to talk to you about is what got me so excited about this approach and a whole range of other people too, not just me. 300 people who attended Te Puki, um, will attest to this. So one of the things um, that the Safe and Together approach is shown to do is reduce, reduce family violence in and of itself, but also as an offshoot of that, and more importantly, it's been shown to reduce out-of-home placements for children. So that was, for me, one of the key selling points about the approach because, you know, we know that in Aotearoa, uplifting of children is um, a very real issue and there's also a lot of understanding about how that, um, who we uplift and the inequitable distribution of the uplifting process. So that was very exciting and I, what I find throughout the model is that it focus, focuses continually on child well-being, and I think for me that really helped me to stop um, being drawn off in other directions and thinking about well, 
what's happening in the relationship. And instead of like being distracted by that, I could focus on what's the impact of, of the violence on the children. And keeping coming back to that all the time is um, one of the things I really like about the process. It also sets out really strongly to challenge the failure to protect, protect paradigm. That's quite hard to say. But the failure to protect paradigm is the paradigm that says to the safe parent, you're not protecting your children. And therefore, if you don't start protecting them by um, either leaving, getting a protection order or calling the police, which is generally the suite of actions we, we give, if you don't start doing that pretty quickly, then your children are at risk of being uplifted. And that's many, many women experience that and talk to us about um, how unhelpful that is and how they feel like they're the ones who are trying their hardest to protect their children and their efforts go unnoticed because they don't look like what we expect it to look like. And it's placing the onus on the person who's the victim survivor and not on the person who's creating the problem, which is the perpetrator of the violence. The other thing is that it's a holistic approach and that it um, has, because it has that approach and is less individualistic, it tends to work in Indigenous communities and there's quite a bit of research going on coming out of Australia about working in Aboriginal communities and we're really interested in how, how that might look in a context in Aotearoa. Um, it also addresses the invisibility of fathers and the gender bias in practice. So it, there's a lot of unpacking of gender bias and the kind of high expectations we have for mothers around mothering and the, the lower expectations we have for fathers and how unhelpful that bias can be in practice for both um, good fathers and less good fathers. It's not helpful for us to have low expectations and to have such high expectations of mothers. What we're looking for in thinking about this approach is how to have um, similar expectations of both, of both parents around parenting. Um, a really good example that I'll talk about here is that in one of the death reviews that we did, there was a community agency that drove up to a house to talk to a mother to do a parenting assessment. When they arrived at the house, dad was there holding the, ch uh, the young child and, and he reported that mum wasn't there. So the agency drove away, but there was an opportunity there for us to talk to dad about him and his parenting. And, and I don't know if it would have come out, but at the time that was um, a man who kept the child at the house so that he could ensure that mum returned from wherever he'd allowed her to go. So there was coercive control going on there and children were being used to do that. Um, it also reduces professional silos by using a common language and introduces common practice. And what we've found is that that's um, created better relationships between the NGO and the statutory sector when, when all parties in the system are able to use similar language and come with similar understandings then there's less uh, raru raru around it. So it's a framework that's designed to partner with a survivor, intervene with perpetrators, both with the purpose to enhance the safety and well-being of children. So and it's relevant to everyone whose work touches family violence, whether you work with perpetrators generally, victim survivors generally, or children, or all three. So we've been working with police and corrections and women's refuge, um, across you know stopping violence services. It fits across all parts of the system, which um, I really like that approach because it feels like to me, um, obviously coming from the Family Violence Death Review Committee and the fifth report, the system really needs to think about how it operates. So just a little bit, we, the mission is to be go international. So I thought I'd share with you some of the places um, where this approach is being used. I'd really like to see New Zealand on that map, but they don't, um, well, we're on the map, but we're not on the writing. So um, they only update their slides once a year. So come next year, we'll have a New Zealand um, part as well. But I think particularly where um, we've seen it, 
I've seen a lot of stuff coming out of Australia around the Safe and Together approach. Um, the Federal Family Court in Australia has just adopted it and is going to be training its entire judiciary and the practices. Anne Rose has done a lot of work around invisible practices and walking with dads um, and the Patricia Project. All those things um, have come out of Australia in the last two or three years. Safe and Together has been in Australia for about 11 years now, um, but more and more I'm seeing it being cited in references across um, a lot of material that's coming out. Um, it's also just been made mandatory social work. Um, training in, in the state of Victoria. So I just thought I'd let you know that it's not kind of a random thing. It has um, a lot of, a, a huge network of people who are working towards um, getting these understandings integrated into child protection practice. Um, so a little bit more about the model. The whole purpose of the model is to achieve better outcomes for families and systems. So it has a strong practice focus. Um, it spends a lot of time thinking about interviewing, doing assessments, how we document and how we case plan when we're using a domestic violence lens. So um, it aims to improve worker competencies but not just that, it's also about system competency and improving cross-system collaboration. Um, at its foundation, it has some critical principles and some critical components and some ways of working, which I'll go over today. But what I really like about it is the fact that it's got some really practical tools. So it's got, um, when we say we talk about a perpetrator pattern-based approach, one of the practice tools is a mapping tool that helps you to fully map out the perpetrator pattern of behaviour. And it's got some other tools around case planning and pivoting um, that are really practical and everyday, things you can use every day in your work. Um, so what we're wanting is better outcomes for families, better, more safety, making families more safe, improving their wellbeing, and improving permanency of placements. So people's children staying in safe places with safe adults. And doing that through better assessment, better interviewing, better documentation, better partnerships and better case plans. And when you put all of that together, that kind of, it's what I find is that when one part of the system shifts and we get better practice, then that can help to influence other parts of the system as well. So some of the key principles, I'm just going to run through them for you. So the first principle is obviously straight from the wording, keeping the child safe and together with the non-offending parent. So this, um, the principles are really consistent with a strengths-based approach. So I want I want to add again. I know I've already said it, but it's not it's not a whole change of practice. It's some tweaking of stuff we already know and adding in a domestic violence informed lens into the practice. So um, keeping the child safe and together with the non-offending parent. The the parts that make that up are about keeping the child safe, helping the child to heal from trauma and helping to keep the ch children in stable places and being nurtured. So that's the whole aim of that first principle. Second principle is about partnering with the non-offending parent as a default position. So partnering is the complete opposite of the um, paradigm I talked about before where we end up blaming victims. So this is reframing that and trying to partner with the non-offending parent as our first step. And why we do that in this approach is because A, it's, it's efficient. She often knows way more. You know, if we're starting from a perpetrator pattern, then she knows a lot about that perpetrator pattern and we can find out about what she knows about how to keep herself and the children safe. So it's 
um, it, it's probably more effective than because to talk to the perpetrator about that, we may not get the same amount of detail or information about it, and we know that it can be minimised and manipulated at times. And it's also very child-centred in terms of um, making sure that we're connecting the child with the safe parent. So we're always thinking about keeping the children safe in partnership with the safe parent. Um, so an example of that is um, if people go and they're there to talk to the victim survivor and say things like, well, well, we're here to talk to you about a family violence episode that happened last night, which is sometimes how um, it gets, victims get confronted with that, versus um, we're here to talk to you about your partner's violence and how it impacts on you and the children, which is a little bit of a different shift. And that's a, a really small example of how we'd shift language to indicate a partnership with her. So we're not there to um, make her responsible for the violence that she's been subjected to. Um, and the third principle is that we want to intervene with the perpetrator to reduce risk and harm to the child. So it's not intervention for the sake of it, it's very um, targeted, it's about reducing risk and harm to the children. And the interventions are really focused on producing um, meaningful behaviour change. We're not just asking him to attend a course and get a certificate but we're asking him to stop the actions that cause the harm to the family, which is why understanding the perpetrator's pattern of behaviour is so important, because if you don't understand that, you can't ask him to change those behaviours. Um, and we're doing it through engagement, first and foremost, um, because I guess a lot of the practice has evolved is that we spend a lot of time talking to victim survivors about his behaviour, but in actual fact, this approach tells us we need to try to talk to him more about his behaviour. So we're wanting to engage with him. We're asking him to be accountable, but we um, often find in the past, I've seen accountability is one of those words that gets bandied around a bit, but really unpacking that a bit and saying, who do we want him to be accountable to and what do we want him to be accountable for? And so if I answer that from a safe and together perspective, that would be, we want him to be accountable to his children and his partner, and we want him to be accountable for his violence. So if you're thinking about how do we create case plans that ask him to do that? So that might be, well, you know, you're separated at the moment, but would you be prepared in the interests of your children to continue to pay the child support that, you know, if he's threatening to stop doing that? Because that will mean that your children will be able to continue their after school activities. And we know that if children can keep um, stable routines, that's going to help them to heal from trauma. So that's how the whole thing kind of fits together. And Deliberately, in the intervening with perpetrators, the last thing is the court's process because sometimes um, there are some perpetrators for whom engagement and accountability, um, uh, they're not going to cooperate and, and be with there. And at times the courts is the right response and a needed response. So it's there, but it's really important to understand that when I'm talking about accountability, I'm not just talking about um, our traditional criminal justice system. Okay. Going to introduce you to um, this idea, which is a, one of the key concepts in the approach, and that is that there are multiple pathways to harm for children. So, um, this is, I find this slide really helpful for thinking about our assessments. So we look at the perpetrator's pattern, we understand the coercive control that's being enacted towards the adult survivor, and we can understand what actions are being taken to harm the children. And we can look at that, and we're pretty good at writing about this and documenting harm to children when we're thinking about physical injuries, 
behavioural changes, emotional harms, and social and educational and developmental um, impacts. Um, but what the multiple pathways to harm is um, encouraging us is to take a, a broader way of thinking about that. So if we're thinking about children's trauma and safety, um, we're also thinking about them seeing, hearing, or learning about the violence. And when I say violence, I'm thinking coercive control is violence. So the whole package of behaviours. What are they seeing? What are they hearing? Or what are they learning? And it might be that they are seeing dad being verbally abusive to mum and calling her a slut and a whore and other names like that. So what what is what are they learning about mum and dad? in that interaction and what is the harm to them developmentally so that's one way of thinking about it but to add to that also thinking about how the perpetrator's pattern affects the family ecology so for instance loss of income how is that connected to a perpetrator's pattern so if we can uncover things like and we've had situations where a mum's job loss is a direct result of dad's um, continued harassment at work so he's constantly ringing all the time and the work gets jittery about that speaks to her about that and she leaves because it's easier to do that and then the resulting loss of income to the family and then linking that back to how does that harm the children so if there's less income and resources into that family what is the impact on the children so if I go back to their after school activities they're less able to have after school activities but what does that do to their social and educational and emotional development if they don't have social activities with other children of their own age? So it's going around that whole cycle and thinking about how has the perpetrator's behaviour led to housing instability? How has it led to loss of contact with the extended family? What have been the impacts on schooling and social disruptions? So thinking in that really broad way, but always in our assessments and documentation, linking that back to harming children. And I think this one, the last one, the effect on partners' parenting is often the part where we are less good at connecting this to harm to children. And it's, it's probably one of those areas where I think um, we can slip into blaming mum, blaming the safe parent. So, for instance, many um, people who are in abusive relationships suffer from things like depression, PTSD, anxiety, and substance abuse. And I think there's a, sometimes a danger if we don't think about it using a domestic violence informed lens that we see it as two separate silos that uh, dad's got a violence problem and mum's got a drinking problem, but we're not connecting mum's drinking problem to the abuse and tr uh, trying to understand if it is connected and then linking to, so what does that mean for those children so, uh, and writing about that? Um, so mum's drinking to cope with his violence and what does that do to the children? So connecting all the dots is a way I think about it. Um, and same with, um, how, does mum experience a loss of authority over her children because of the abuse? How much of the domestic violence survivor's energy is going into addressing the perpetrator instead of being focused on the children? How does his behaviour interfere with the day-to-day -day routine and basic care of that family? So that's a, a broadly speaking as a way to think about um, how do we um, make sure we're covering off all those things when we're thinking about our assessments? So those kind of ideas, though, can, what I like about this is it's very practical and you can um, use it to inform your practice. But say if you're interviewing with a perpetrator, you can ask questions like, so how did your arrest and time in custody affect the overall functioning of your family? Did it, did it make it weaker or did it make it stronger? You know, because with dad goes into custody, there's a whole lot of implications of that. And it's when you're talking with him, um, asking him about what those implications are because you know I guess we're trying to 
um, engage with dad around what sort of parent he wants to be and him understanding when actions like getting placed in custody, losing his job, that has a flow-on effect into the family ecology and particularly onto the children. Um, and when you're talking with the survivor, for instance, you can ask things like, how does your partner support or undermine your parenting? And then you're exploring that with her. So you're not just going for the bad stuff, you're also looking for support, but you're interested in how it's undermining as well. Okay. I'm just going to move on to... This is the domestic violence continuum. So on the left-hand side, we're talking about um, domestic violence destructive, moving through to domestic violence proficient. So we've got five, so from destructive to neglectful to pre-competent to competent to proficient. So this continuum is in, your, in, in the handout that you'll get, and it's explained in quite a bit more detail. But what it's suggesting is that if you're operating at the left-hand side, the domestic violence destructive, then underneath there, that might include policies, that might include practices or training or services or collaboration that effectively can make the situation worse or less safe. So I've got an example from my work in corrections, and this is an old example, so this is not reflective of current practice. But when I first um, went back to corrections, probably about 10 years ago, um, there was a policy in place that whenever no couple who, where there was a conviction for a family violence offence, were allowed to live together. So that meant that every couple who had, where there was um, a male assaults female charge or whatever, that they could not live together and they had to separate. Now, I was really concerned about that because if you understand, if you have an understanding of family violence, you understand that separation can be a very risky time for current for couples. And if there's coercive control going on, and um, uh, then the perpetrator can feel very um, threatened by a separation, it's, it's a loss of control, it's a loss of surveillance, it's a loss of being able to monitor what she's doing and where she's going. So to um, artificially force couples to separate on a blanket, in a blanket kind of way, to me felt like a very um, dangerous policy because it didn't fit for every situation and it certainly didn't take account of any risk assessment. So that's just one example that I thought I would share with you around something that would be a DV destructive policy. But we can also, across our agencies, have DV destructive practices, training, services, and collaboration. I think, you know, when, when systems are fighting against each other, that can be DV destructive. Um, and of course, what we're trying to do is move from domestic violence destructive to domestic violence proficient. And there's some really good stuff in the handout where you can kind of do a self-assessment, not just about your own practice, because this is about systems. This is about how is our system working in a proficient way or not. So those are the, it encourages you to think about that for yourself. So I just want to talk about the four arrows down below the weak practice and the strong practice. So those are again continuums within a continuum. So on the left hand side is the weak practice moving to the strong practice. So weak practice is when practice is very focused only on the adults issues. And what we would want to be moving to is practice where um, we focus on the adults as well as the children. So it's integrated with the children and children are seen as part of that system, not an add-on, not a side bit, not something to be considered last, but an integral part of the system. Um, weak practice is when we um, make victim survivors um, responsible for the violence that's happening to them and accuse them of failing to protect their children. Whereas strong practice is moving towards understanding a perpetrator pattern of behaviour. Um, weak practices is when fathers are invisible 
and strong practices when we hold the same high standards for fathers around parenting that we do for mothers. Um, and weak practices when practices about the child versus the adult survivor. So um, it's either or the child or the adult. Um, and yeah, we'll explore that a little bit in a minute. Or moving up into child safety and well-being, being tied to the safe adult. So we know that that children are better off if they can be kept safe and together with their and with their safe parent. Okay, we're going to have a little go. I feel like I've been talking forever. We're going to have a little go at listening to some statements that um, I'm going to read out to you, and then I want you to make a decision about whether you think it's de destructive, neglectful, pre-competent, competent, or proficient. Um, Around, so listen to the statement, make a decision, and Miriam's going to put up a little checkbox for you to vote on, and then um, you can put some chat, you can put some further development of it into the chat box if you don't mind, and Miriam's also going to manage that for me, she's very busy. Okay, so the question is, whereabouts on the continuum does this statement sit? So I'm going to start. So Marion is failing to protect her children from her partner's violence and she keeps picking him over the children. Have a go. Shall I read that again? Marion is failing to protect her children from her partner's violence and keeps picking him over the children. A few more people are still entering in the poll, so it should have come up. So I'll close the poll now in three seconds. Well done. Yep, so we can see that the majority of you thinking it's at the weak end of practice. Um, is there any thinking that we can monitor in the chat box, Miriam, about why you're thinking it's more at that end? What's the clue? So we don't have any answers yet. I think um, maybe some, you know, compared to face-to-face -face sessions, typing things <laughs> takes a... Takes a bit longer. A, a couple good. of seconds longer, yeah. It's, That's it's, all good. Can I, I have a time check? Um, we are 20 to... Well, 18 minutes to three. Lovely, thank you. Yeah. Um, so here we have the, the failure to protect was what um, someone noticed. It puts yep. the blame back on the safe parent. Correct. Um, the mom is picking uh, the partner over the children. Yep, so that's the clue. That so those when we, as, if, as if she had a choice. So not fully understanding is there coercive control and how much choice does she actually have. Yeah, yep. and that's what someone else just knows. The language positions the safe parent is failing to protect yep. and that the blame or responsibility is back on this um, victim survivor. So, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, number, shall we do another one? Um, they are in a volatile relationship and if they separate, we will no longer have any concerns. So they are in a volatile relationship, and if they separate, we will no longer have concerns. Mm, interesting spread. Okay. 
So just some um, responses from the chat is places equal blame for violence on both parties. Negatful yeah. assumes separation equals protection for safe parent and the child, children, whereas separation often, often increases risk. Excellent. Any other comments from our audience? That so might be all. Okay, so it's definitely in the... Um, on the left hand side of the continuum so kind of neglectful destructive around there yeah cool well done okay what about this one we don't want to re-victimize the mother but our job is child safety we don't want to re-victimize the mother but our job is child safety Okay, looks, I'll give a couple more seconds for people to fill it in. A few more coming through. So these are the results and we have a comment already. Um, the perpetrator is invisible in this statement is what one person commented. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so someone's saying this, the examples are a little bit confusing. So I'm wondering if that person can maybe elaborate in particular, if there's anything specific that we're finding confusing so we can help clarify. Um, yep. The other people are saying our job should be victim safety. Um, and someone else is saying recognizes the inequity of the victim. Um, so the inequity of re-victimizing the safe parent, but not enough protection is considered. Right. Yep, and we're kind of linking this one to the last blue arrow, child safety and well-being being tied to the adult. And, and it's kind of pre pre-competent, isn't it? Because there's there's an acknowledgement we don't want to re-victimize. So there's an acknowledgement we know that we could, but there's also but our job is child safety. Yeah, whereas we're sort of saying, well, actually child safety and adult survivor safety are integrally, integrally linked. So we, we, we can't separate them out. Yeah, so it's more around the pre-competent, neglectful end. Yeah, but yeah, good going. Well done. That's great. Um, okay, one more. Actually, maybe two. We know he needs to do a program but there's no funding for that. So we'll send him to a free parenting course instead. We know he needs to do a program, but there's no funding for that to happen. So we'll send him to a free parenting course instead. Okay, a few more coming through. Give you a couple more seconds. Okay. So right. That's your spread. Yep. yep. So definitely, so the bulk of you think that's pre-competent and that's where I've got it too, but obviously these are a little bit can move on. Uh, you know, they're not definitive, but it's in the pre-competent kind of area um, because we know he needs to do a program. So we're contemplating that that's the right thing to do, but, but we'll send him to a free parenting course instead. Okay, so there's... Oh, so the um, this, this is a good clarifying question. So these, um, these categories are for the professionals. That's um, the, what the person was trying to clarify. So that's why they potentially were a bit confusing. Um, and so, yes, we're trying to understand the professional and the system's response. Where does that sit along 
aligning with a destructive practice around domestic violence and a competent practice around yeah. or proficient sorry practice around domestic violence so that helped clarify um Thank and someone for that person for doing yeah that. yeah and someone um commented that in this last scenario there's limited systems of support so it would still be pre um competent yeah and so thinking about that also and these scenarios are always tricky because you we don't there's never enough um converse, uh detail to fully go what's going on but it's about starting to attune to what you're talking about before around the paradigm shift like is That's it moving right. towards the paradigm of becoming more proficient or are we still in that destructive space yeah and these um statements have been taken from real case notes or real things that have been heard at comments made in case discussions or in um, safety assessment meetings, for instance, at Fabias. Yeah. So and that's a point of clarification. Yeah. Um, and um, we've got 10 minutes left. Um, yep. And there's a few questions coming through as okay, well. Cool. So I'll just tell you the answer to the next one because. Um, So the last comment is, the perpetrator's behaviour and choices are the source of our concern for child safety. So that's domestic violence proficient or competent because it's linking the concern for the child's safety back to the perpetrator's pattern of behaviour. So just last one to clarify, but we, yeah, we'll move on. But thank you for participating in that. It's always tricky to do um, interactive things like this when, um, when we're stuck on Zoom. But we're doing, I'm really impressed with the technology, Miriam. You're doing a great job. Okay, so um, I guess just to wrap it up, I, I was going to talk a little bit about um, something that happened here quite recently. We had a report back from a lawyer for child who had been talking with the children and noticed or knew about um, a family pet that the children were really attached to. It was a cat. Um, and thought that that cat was a significant part of the children healing from trauma, having a pet, having someone, something to love them, etc. cetera. So um, the lawyer for child was talking to the children and found out that um, mum had given away the pet the week before and the children were very upset and distraught about that behaviour and the lawyer could not understand why the mother would have done that. So um, in talking with mum, I mean, and understanding the perpetrator's pattern of behaviour, it came, came out that um, dad had killed a previous family pet and was threatening to kill this one. And so when you understand that, it puts mum's behaviour into a context and means we don't fall into the trap of um, blaming her and, and calling her a bad mum and not being acting in the interests of the children. So I thought that was just a, a really useful um, illustration of the whole kind of framework that we're talking about and how using a safe and together domestic violence informed child protection lens helps to guide our practice around thinking more broadly about that. Okay, so um, lastly, um, just want to talk a little bit about the resources. So um, what I really want to let you know about is that the Safe and Together Institute has got a fantastic website that has a lot of amazing free resources on it that you can use. In particular, this one, How to Be an Ally to a Loved One Experiencing Domestic Violence. So that is for family members. And it's a um, really brilliant illustration. It's got some great stuff about coercive control and understanding that from a friend or family perspective. So I thought that might be useful. Also say there's some fantastic podcasts. I've been listening to um, podcasts about parental alienation in the family court and how, although I keep being told we don't have that in New Zealand, but I think that we do, but we call it some other things as well. But how, how perpetrators can manipulate the family court system by using parental alienation. Um, there's a fantastic one on how not to collude with perpetrators, which I'd highly recommend, but there's ha literally hundreds. So um, do fill your boots, go and have a look at it, and um, yeah, see. So, Miriam, that's me. So I can stop talking now and you can ask me questions. 
Uh, we'll start with um, the, the, there's just one that popped up before um, the la about the last example um, that you said that was, uh, I think it was the domestic violence proficient. And the person is just asking, isn't it destruct destructive to send someone some, sorry, isn't it destructive to send someone to something we know isn't suitable? And that's connected to the last example. Just if you wanted to clarify that for the person. So the last example I gave was um, the perpetrator's behaviour and choices are the source of our concern for the child's safety. So I think the person's referring to, to the, the previous one, to the one about sending him to a parenting program. Possibly, yeah, that sounds more. That is was that the only the one? one that we were sending someone somewhere. Yep. So possibly, yep. yes. So I think what I said about that was it was pre-competent because oh. it's acknowledging that he needs to do a program. So there's some thinking, yeah, he needs to do a violence program. So we're onto mm. it a little bit, but then we've got a system that doesn't give the funding to allow that to happen. So we settle for something less. So I, th I totally agree with the person who made that comment. That's not good practice. Great. So just, yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Um, cool. And I think you've kind of answered quite a bit of this, um, but in terms of your principle three around intervening with a perpetrator, um, like, does it include that kind of therapeutic lens for people who are harmful, um, you know, do use this kind of behaviour as a form of gaining their needs or exerting power over others? Sorry, I'm not quite understanding what you're asking. But, and so does the model kind of emphasise the use of therapy um, for perpetrators? Um, so what it would say is... Um, would you be, you know, if, some, if a perpetrator says I've been traumatised and I've had a terrible experience in my life as well, and that, then there's no ignoring of that, there's talking about that, but there's also saying, so would you commit in a plan <coughs> to going and seeing someone regularly to address that issue? <coughs> so it's before the therapy, but it would ask them as a commitment to making, to helping their children to become more safe would you commit to attending therapy? So it's before right. the therapy, but the therapy is definitely an option. Absolutely. Now we have a biggie um, and, I, okay. and, I, and it will probably take up a little bit of time because I think it's, um, a, there's, there's the linked in two questions. One is around, um, is this model working with Indigenous people? And you talked a little bit about the work in Australia, but there's, and I think it links in really well to, what you said at the beginning around the paradigm shift, so the concept that child-centred social work is fundamentally anti fano anti Māori. How does this approach engage and address historical colonial trauma in the perpetrating parent? And I think there's some um, really important intersectional crux in that question, which Aroha Mai is not going to get answered probably decently in four mm. um, minutes, but I think it's a really valid question for all of us to keep asking. Um, also, you know, in the chat we were talking about really remembering that child protection practices towards Indigenous people are part of a colonial project that exactly. was intentional um, and continues to be intentional now. So, yeah, just um, th th uh, th wondering... <laughs> what how you would like to respond to that as well and and both of Ooh. us being you know white um white settlers and our yes. positionality in them yeah absolutely and i think um that's one of the things that i haven't talked a lot about in today's session and it doesn't cover it um fully but the um Safe and Together approach uses intersect intersectionality so an analysis of power um, based on a whole range of things. So um, the Indigenous, um, the, the history of colonisation in this country and the impact that mm. that's had on the Indigenous population is a huge part of that thinking of mm. what are the intersections and how are people more disadvantaged because of coming from, um, you know, where are the marginalised places in our mm. um communities but what I particularly like about it is that it takes that even into a very practice-based thing so if you're thinking about a perpetrator's pattern 
I mean, this is a simple example, but if you have a white perpetrator who is enacting violence against um, a woman of colour, then how is that intersectionality being used as a tool of oppression or coercive control? What is the perpetrator's pattern around, mm. you know, is he using racism as a form of, you know, is he calling her a black bitch? Sorry to be like this, but just using this as an example. Mm. And if he's doing that, how is that impacting on the children? And I'd be thinking around their developmental needs, their identity needs, you know, like mm. is he rupturing their connection to their culture by using such um, language mm. and treatment of their mother? So, yeah, and I suppose what I'm hearing, yeah, Sorry. what I'm what I was thinking is I'm hearing in terms of paradigm shift is also when it's, um, you know, a family or whanau which, uh, you know, all are in the margins and how is the system replicating that? Yeah. And then how do we hold the system accountable to, yeah. you know, so moving out of the ecology just of the, the, yeah. the where, where the violence in that moment is located to the child and broadening out to the broader violence that occurs daily potentially for the adults in that um yeah. in that family too so it's um, yeah. it's about yeah. yeah locating power um yep. within within the system as well as within um the, fa the yeah. family or the grouping of people yeah yeah and we talk a lot about um social entrapment through coercive control but actually if you think about the history of colonization that is also coercive control and we have systemic entrapment that occurs as a result of that. And that's some of the analysis mm -hmm. that we have to get better at when we're working, and I say we as a collective professional group, when we're working mm -hmm. with people on the, at the margins who've been Absolutely. disadvantaged throughout their um, lives. Who've been oppressed. Yeah, it's, you know, when, when we have that... Um, that oppression that's present. So unfortunately, we need to um, wrap it up here today. And I kind of feel that that needs to be a whole other webinar in itself of um, how do we weave in multiple sites of oppression within all of our practices? Like, how do we weave in that really profound anti-oppressive practice yeah. um, within Aotearoa New Zealand? That is that is a great other women webinar totally agree so we'll take that on board and have another webinar on that so firstly um, oh excuse me Miriam you're going to put up the link to the event bright thing yes. for me that's the only other thing we need to do yes thank you so do you want to talk briefly about that Julie sure. just as I get sure. the link we've got a core training coming up in Christchurch uh in October, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the dates, but the link will tell you. If you're interested, follow the link and you can get more information. That's all I need to say. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Julie, for today. I think it's um, that paradigm shift and system change and challenging our thinking and reflecting is always something that I think is useful for us to do and think about and um, draw on. So I want to thank you and thank all of uh, all of those that have joined us today um, in this session. And hopefully you've um, found some, you know, things to think about things to take home but also um yeah let's keep thinking in this space because it's an area that we we need to keep um, shifting those paradigms to do better for our communities so thank you for that challenge um we will close with a karakia so you can all go well unihia 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 ki te uri tapunui ki a wātea ke māma te nākau te tinana te wairua i te aratakata ko ia rā e rongo whakairia ake ki runga ki a tīna tīna hui e tai ki e Go well everyone, thank you so much Julie Thanks everybody